All right, thank you very much, Professor Nicola, Jeff, good friend. Uh, I'd like to start, um, good day, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a bit colder than what I'm used to, but I grew up in Europe so I can deal with the wetness and the cold, I actually enjoy it. Um, a great thank you to the, the group here, also Professor Horsak, for hosting me here together with uh, Professor Nicola. It's great to see snail work of high quality being performed uh, also at this university. I look forward to discuss more over a beer maybe later today. I believe we have a social <laughs> later this evening, so uh, if any of you can, please join us. It'll be fun to talk snails. But um, there we go. Um, title with that introduction, a kind introduction. You've covered many of the things I'll talk about, so I think I'll just take off and, and leave here. So <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, so today's talk, uh, my talk here, is called Ficella Acuta Ecogenomics and Snail Population Fitness. Uh, the image will make a bit more sense when we get there, but uh, let me start, perhaps on you, but I'd like to acknowledge a number of people first. This tends to come at the end of talks, and then you are pressed for time, so I thought I would do this right away. I've done snail research for a long time, but uh, you can never do research alone. It is a group effort, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the following people here. Uh, what is important, of course, is a, uh, uh, a site for doing your research, so I acknowledge that uh, I put snails in back in nature, the Rio Grande Nature Center State Park. Lots of computer work is uh, supported by CARSI, which is the Center for Advanced Research Computing at the University of New Mexico. Those are the resources. Of course, people are always very important. I'll start to my left here. This is uh, Professor Mario Castillo from New Mexico State University. Two of our students, <coughs> Taylor and Todd, um, undergrad and graduate student help out with data collection and analysis. Then at the University of New Mexico, my home base, uh, there is Bisho Ehana and there's John Schultz. These are previous collaborators. They have found jobs. There's more future after uh, being a student at a university, so that can be done. To the right, we see Kevin, my current graduate student towards a PhD. Marian Posavi here is our uh, bioinformatics guy, and Juliana de Core is a post bac volunteer. Uh, she's going to med school but learns about snails initially. So those are the people that uh, have been very instrumental in getting some of these things going. Some of these things, uh, when I start to think about the, uh, the presentation here, uh, the context in which I'm teaching, uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of where I come from, what I've done, and how that then connects to the research I currently do. Because I've been working with snails ever since my PhD, and I would like to share you in the topics of this talk here, uh, my path in snails to Ficilla acuta. I would call myself, uh, just a couple of years ago, a molecular immunoparasitology interested investigator. I am a lab rat. Uh, I hardly ever came out. I began looking at the pond snail, Limnea stagnalis, and did cellular cytotoxicity studies. I then moved on, as uh, Jeff mentioned, I went to the University of New Mexico, looked at a different species of snail, Biomphaladia glabrata, and I started to look at non-self uh, recognition factors and uh, genomics to support the intriguing findings that we were uh, encountering. Of course, lab research is great. You can do lab research, you can do field research, but it's great if things meet. And if you engage in any of these, you'll find that questions are presenting themselves that you cannot answer with just a single approach. So I will share with you some of the complexities that uh, made me reconsider what are good model organisms, uh, how does it relate to families of snails, so phylogeny, taxonomy is important. And then, of course, uh, one model, snail immunology versus individual immun immune responses. We tend to look at averages rather than uh, individual responses. Uh, I'll touch on that. But, of course, we need to consider what uh, happens in an individual snail. So lab versus field are things to consider in full interpretation of the relevant biology. That then gets me to Faisal Acuta. I believe I have three hours for this lecture here, so uh, we'll get there. I'm kidding, this should all fit in, in one hour, but realize I'll be talking about snail immunology, my path of discovery, before I actually start to talk about Ficella acuta, the snail for my title, uh, going into some mitogenomics, interesting findings there, and then relating that to differential fitness in populations genetically characterized of this uh, species as we observe it in the field and trying to understand 
what drives that. That's the itinerary for our talk right here, so let me dive in and uh, explain why I would be looking at snails originally. My PhD was from a medical faculty. You might say, what does a person like that do with snails? But of course we have to realize that snails, abundant and diverse as they are, um, have a lot to tell us about immune function in snails. Uh, up to the left right here, the hygrophila, hygrophila in my American accent, uh, are freshwater snails with lungs, and they belong to the pan pulmonata. Here again, sort of aging myself a bit, are the uh, times that I started to investigate uh, these particular species. Reason to look at these snails in the first place is that uh, snails are somewhat diverse, but there's anywhere between 18 and 40,000 estimated species of parasites of the Trematoda. And trematoda, of course, are flatworm parasites that have highly diverse life cycles. Only a very small sample of that in this figure right here, from a paper by a friend of mine, uh, Patrick Hannington. But diverse as the morphologies are and the life cycles are and uh, lines cross over, the one common feature of all these life cycles is that they, uh, the parasites rely absolutely an, on obligatory hosts that are gastropods. So this is a very tight aff uh, affiliation, evolutionary, very selective. Snails need to interact, need to defend themselves against these parasites. And this is a very common occurrence. If we knew a bit more about how those snails deal with their parasites and could avoid them from traveling through the snail, the vertebrates, and that may include us, would never get infected. So there's good reasons to understand a bit better what that interaction is. Snails, <coughs> some diversity in the group that I study, and what I've done here is on this recent phylogeny uh, from, uh, what is it, Sadi, working together with Angus Davison. They are of Scotland here in Europe. A molecular phylogeny that uh, is based on the large subunit and the 5.8S uh, RDNA sequences, and it places the relative families, the major families within the hygrophila, uh, here we see the planorbidae, flat uh, shells that are round and coiled. And now we also see the limnaeidae and the physidae, three main families. There's other groups, but I will not address those in this particular talk. This is the relationship of uh, snails that I work with at the family level. So realize this, and also realize that I've looked at the main representatives of a very large group. And that, of course, helps to get a general overview of uh, immune function of the biology of snails more general than just in one species. Why then look at snails? I'd like to develop that a little bit further. Jeff in his introduction already mentioned that schistosomes is a, uh, a group of parasites transmitted by snails. And indeed from the get-go that has been one of my main reasons to start studying snails. Biomphalaria is one of those snails. You can see the planorbid shell right there. Involved in transmission of human schistosomiasis, and this is a very pernicious infectious disease, mostly in the tropics. I'm happy to say that uh, uh, it is restricted at least somewhat, but that may not make happy the 200 million people that are currently infected with that parasite. Low mortality, but significant morbidity. People really get into a bad condition with those parasites. In the area where the snail lives and can transmit this parasite, another easily 600 million people are at risk of infection. So a very significant impact on global human health. Life cycles, I'm a parasitologist, we like to show life cycles. So uh, just briefly, we see the parasite enter the snail. It develops in there that obligatory interaction, and then it comes out as a Parasite stage, it can infect humans. It'll develop in humans, uh, lay eggs, and the life cycle completes. I'm not going too deep into that. But what is fascinating is that while we always consider a lot about what happens in humans, how do we get sick, how can we cure them, how can we uh, protect people from infection, there is always a lot less attention for what happens in the snail. And if you study that model, we start to learn that the parasite does modify the snail host. Infection will impact the growth rate, organ development, motility, basal metabolism, gene expression in the central nervous system. Uh, it may actually castrate the snail altogether, ceasing reproduction of the snail itself. 
and the parasite may even modulate the immune function of the snail itself. So we're talking about a very complex interaction that uh, is effectively amounting to an extended phenotype. If I see a snail in the field and I know it's a parasite, I'm actually not looking at a snail anymore, but I'm looking at a phenotypic iteration of the snail. So consider that an extended phenotype. Now, it is thought, of course, that uh, this affords the parasite resources for long-term survival and development. But uh, interesting questions. How are these modifications affected and how are they maintained? What does the parasite do to actually achieve this modification of the host? So those are some of the questions that drive me. And uh, as I mentioned, snail distribution correlates with parasite transmission. No snails, no parasites, no disease. So knowing about the things on the right will inform on that transmission. Then intriguingly, um, <laughs> the, uh, just blown it out, but we know that about 50% of snails in the field actually encounter parasites and do get infected. But if you collect snails and start to look for infection uh, prevalence, so how many snails are actually infected, you will see that only about 6% as a high number uh, is infected. So a lot happens. These snails are not defenseless hosts. They actually engage in defenses, and they may frequently defeat the parasite that infects them, because clearly they have a disadvantage, and they protect themselves against that. It just does not always work out good for the snail, and the question is again, uh, what specific aspects of snail biology determine snail host competence is something that has driven my research for several decades now. So in that context, you can sort of uh, distill all of what I just showed to this particular question. It is one of compatibility. We have a parasite, this is the mirosidial stage of a parasite, encounter a snail and it will infect that snail, it will enter it. and then. Yeah, if the parasite can live in that snail, it's going to continue on its life cycle, and the parasite emerges after development in a stage it can infect the next host. And you might think that happens all the time, but in fact what happens most is the parasite enters the snail, and it does not survive to develop and continue its life cycle. So susceptible happens, but resistant refractory, either immunologically resistant or not supporting by its physiology development of the parasite, those are the things that are really interesting to us. Because if we knew the secret to resistance, we could prevent those vertebrate hosts, including humans, to be uh, infected with this parasite. Again, that is a question that I've been pursuing for quite some time. And now you might say, well, we know a lot about immunology, there's big textbooks on that, uh, go to any medical school or even biology, and you will learn about immunology. There are a couple of reservations with that, however, because if we consider animals and immunity here, uh, by the way, this complex slide here on the left shows a very simplified tree. It's a little bit outdated, perhaps, but the, the main points hold true of animal phylogeny. We have prebiliteria here, we have the uh, protostome invertebrates here with our lophotrochozoa and ecdysozoa, and of course deuterostomes where we find our home in the chordates. Everything that we learn in textbooks about immunology actually applies to that little group. Because you are told, we learned that immunity in our bodies consists of an innate component and that adaptive immunity that is such a beautiful system that relies on lymphocytes, on antibodies, and on memory to manage diseases. And if we once encounter the disease, next time we are protected because we have an immunological memory. But believe it or not, the chordates, and then the group I'm talking about, is basically just 2.5% of biological diversity, is the only group that has this acquired immune capability. The vast majority of animal life, so I'm talking about anything down from the top red box, has innate immunity only. We do not see the cells or the genes that allow for this acquired immunity. There are no IGSF genes, no antibodies in all of those animals. And for decades that led us to the thought that invertebrates are immunologically stupid. They just cannot respond effectively, and if they get infected, they might die, but there's so many of them, so that'll sort of come out. 
That story has been changed. I'll get to a slide in just a bit. But uh, innate immunity, of course, no lymphocytes, no antibodies. There is a reliance of le on lectins for non-self recognition, different type of, uh, of molecules. And those have a sort of a broad recognition capability of sugars that characterize groups of pathogens. So yes, you can distinguish gram-negative from gram-positive bacteria and from yeast or fungi. Is that enough? Eh, we don't know. We refer to those carbohydrates as PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. What we see also are lytic factors, just antibacterial factors. We do have phagocytic cells, but those are more of the macrophage monocytic lineage. So we do not have the lymphoid cells like the B and T cells that we rely on so heavily. And then the notion is there is no immune memory, a very different landscape. So in that context, it becomes a bit more challenging to say, well, how does that immune interaction play out? Because we don't know a lot about the immunity of invertebrates. Certainly not 30 years ago. What do we know? This was my mission as a grad student way back when at the, uh, the Free University, the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And I was tasked to look at uh, blood cell hemocyte mediated cytotoxicity in the pond snail Limnea stagnalis. We see an image of that right here, which is a specific intermediate host of the trematode parasite Trichobilharzia ocellata, or Trichobilharzia ocellata, however you want to pronounce that. And the notion was that, uh, well, we know how macrophages defend themselves, how they deal with and clean up bacteria. Can we find similar systems in that innate component from vertebrates in invertebrates? And over the course of my uh, PhD, I was able to use very traditional techniques, cell biology and, uh, uh, what was it, um, basically uh, photospectrometry, so changing of intensity of substrates, to show that there was a certain enzyme, NADPH oxidase, that probably was the source of producing reactive oxygen intermediates in these hemocytes of the snail. It may sound weird, oxygen molecules, but realize that our own cells kill bacteria by generating what effectively is hydrogen peroxide and uh, bleach that combines uh, the uh, hydrogen peroxide with halides. So bleach kills bacteria, right? We use that to clean things, but we also see that that is very effective in killing bacteria in our own cells. That system appeared to be conserved and uh, was present in snails. Also then, knowing a system like that, I could show using specific inhibitors of the enzymes involved that uh, killing of the parasites by blood cells of the snail was inhibited uh, if I prevented production of those oxygen radicals. At the time, I was able to capture that. This is a hand-drawn figure, believe it or not. This is really is directly from my dissertation. <laughs> but um, the image here represents one of those blood cells from a snail. This is the nucleus. And what I've tried to draw in here is that there are, a, uh, there are these uh, enzymes that are on the membrane of these defense cells of snails. And once they are activated, uh, they will take molecular oxygen and turn that through stepwise reduction into hydrogen peroxide. That then is uh, released either towards an encapsulated target like a parasite, which would be part of the big parasite right here, and in the interface between defense cell and parasite, is where those compounds are toxic and are released and start to attack the parasites. Likewise, that system can be uh, activated and internalized for phagolysosomes and kill bacteria. There was a bit of hand-waving at the time because inhibitors are only so specific and, oh, color reactions, you have high background and all, but um, over the decades, of course, we've moved from those particular techniques, critical, essential, and informative, to genome sequencing. And I can say now, uh, 20, 30 years later, that genomics, from which I've been part, confirmed that the genes for the components of that enzyme system that drives that respiratory burst, the consumption of oxygen to generate toxic chemicals, exists in snails. In fact, compared to this picture now, I can point to graphs like this here and say each of these components, much more detail, I know the genes for this, I know how they interact, and I can say, yes, at the time, this was a good hypothesis, a good working development of what happened, and we now know all the genes that are involved in actually making this system work. So a lot to know about 
uh, hemocyte cytotoxicity in snails to defend themselves against parasites. Time doesn't wait for anyone. Um, other studies have contributed to this also. So what do we know about snail immunity? If we look at the cellular, res cellular response to immune challenge, what we see is that uh, we have those circulating phagocytes that we call hemocytes. Uh, there's an image of them right here. This is on a glass slide through a microscope. And what we know is that these hemocytes can engage in phagocytosis or encapsulation of pathogens. If you look at this cell here, you see that little dot? That means a little bacterium was uh, phagocytosed by this particular hemocyte of Limnaeus tagnalis. And if we look at this uh, different magnification here, the hemocytes are in this halo around the structure level with P. That is a parasite inside the tissues of a snail. So we see a defense reaction being mounted, an inflammation, if you will, uh, of hemocytes that go and at least interact with the parasite. If those hemocytes will kill that uh, uh, parasites, they rely on very potent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Uh, there's mechanical activity because hemocytes really sort of attack physically the membranes of the parasite. They can tear off parts of the surface. Uh, they possess a whole host of lysosomal enzymes, so they can release toxic uh, proteins. And of course, they also produce those reactive oxygen intermediates that I just talked about. Those can be hydrogen peroxide, and they can also be complexed with nitrogen, and then we get nitric oxide. There may be other things, but realize that hemocytes Snail cells are very potent killer cells. As I pointed out on a previous slide, um, potent as these cells are, the parasite frequently wins. Right? Snails do get infected, and that means that whatever systems exist are not effective. Analysis of that outcome show that, okay, these hemocytes can kill the parasites, but at times they are not activated to do so. If the immune system of the snail does not recognize the presence of the parasite, there's no activation, no response, and the parasite just says, hey, I'm here, I'm happily growing, I am not suffering from an immune response. So there is a need to interpret that better, and that is uh, a need for increased understanding of activation and regulation of cellular immunity. The snail can do it, but if it doesn't start, it is going to get infected and the parasite wins. Moving to uh, New Mexico 30 years ago, I then started to look at that other component, not the effectors of immunity, but what regulates the activation of immunity. As you can see on my slides here, I moved to a different snail. This is Biomphalaria glabrata, a planorbit snail. <coughs> and that snail offered a very nice different model, because in that case, if we took a snail, and infected it with a parasite, so we made that combination, and then looked in the liquid part of the blood, we call that plasma, we started to see a precipitate forming, and that really was unique to the infection. Now, I can talk hours, and I will not, about all the molecular techniques from 30 years ago to make a connection between these proteins and then the DNA sequences that code for those proteins. But suffice to say, Going through analysis of that precipitate, characterizing the protein and the genes, we start to characterize what we now call fibrinogen-related proteins. So please realize that these are proteins from the snail made in response to infection, and they will bind antigens of the parasite. So they're like antibodies, but not antibodies. The structure uh, was the reason for the name here, because FREP, or fibrinogen-related proteins, what we found is that uh, the downstream part of the protein had a fibrinogen-like sequence. And that was surprising to us, because fibrinogen, we associate that with blood clotting, right? I do, at least. I mean, certainly when I found this. But snail blood does not clot. Very different physiology and responses to injury. So what was fibrinogen doing there? Big question. If we go upstream in our protein, this is the protein structure, this is the genomic DNA structure here with the exons and introns, but uh, a region that we couldn't really assign any function, and then we found a single domain that characterizes immunoglobulin superfamily proteins. I just said no antibodies, and that is still true, but this is one of the parts of a protein that makes an antibody. 
it functions here differently, but a single domain like this is able to bind to other similar domains or to the surface of, for instance, defense cells, so it can serve a signaling function. That was one type of fibrinogen-related -la protein, fibrinogen, whoops, big fingers going too fast here. <laughs> Here we go again. Um, an immunoglobulin super family. There were two flavors of these preps. One has this particular layout. There's another flavor, another type, that actually has two of those domains. So perhaps it can interact differently with the cells that need to be made aware that there is an attack from a pathogen. Fibrinogen, it can bind to certain carbohydrates, and that gives us a connection to recognition of non-self. So we're looking at a molecule that can sample for and signal the presence of pathogens. So this was the first molecular characterization of non-self recognition in snails in immune context. Really nice. Lots of work, and I have to say lots of the work that we did started to give us the notion that these molecules were highly diversified because we would sequence them and sequence them and we'd get slightly different sequences every time. A specific inspection, so we, then we can do PCR on this gene here, we can uh, just get that exon. And we took the approach of two snails, amplified that region, cloned it out, and then started to sequence to see whether that diversity was really holding up. So 180 clones here and 173 right there. We sequenced all of them, and we found that almost every sequence we encountered was different. So snails are not necessarily stupid in their immunity. They actually generate highly diverse sequences. This is from genomic DNA. I'll uh, remind you of that. So 45 different sequences from this gene right here, and the other snail, 37. Only one of those sequences was actually the same at nucleotide level. That was meaningful at the amino acid level, because if you translate it, only two sequences identical, lots of different proteins from one gene. What was going on here? It turns out that uh, that detailed analysis, continuing on that study, showed that uh, we estimate there are about seven genes for this particular FREP, and those genes are being recombined. So there is an uh, indication that uh, in this snail, for instance, we see the different colors indicate fragments of genes from different locations in the genome. The variants that are being produced actually combine parts of these genes as one new molecule. So we have a random somatic diversification that relies on gene conversion. That would be the best way to explain this pattern. And then the white spots indicate there's an additional signal right here and here and here of point mutations that yield yet additional variation. So snails are able to make very specific, very unique, very different immune recognition factors. And snail A was doing things very different from snail B. Individual snails are immunologically different. You can no longer look at one snail and say, oh, they all respond the same. They do things differently. And this is a dynamic system, so it changes over time. A snail on day one will have different immune capabilities than it does on day two. Very significant findings at the time. This was unheard of, and uh, we spent about a year convincing the editors of science that this was real uh, experimental data. Is there a connection to immune function? This is with the advancing molecular methods, of course. Uh, we applied RNA interference, which is a method where we can uh, reduce the amount of RNA in an organism, a live organism. And applying that method, we can specifically target the gene or the mRNA transcript for one of these FREP genes. And you can see that after treatment, the mRNA for that sequence disappears. A control, of course, essential shows that we're specifically affecting just that particular gene. The mRNA disappeared, and that also led to disappearance of the protein. So non-treated, we see a protein band in each of these groups here the treated snail no longer makes that protein, so we can effectively switch off FREP3, both at the mRNA and protein level. Then snails that were thus treated when exposed to a parasite, we control uh, no infections, but the experimental ones do get infected. Not all of them, there's more at play than just FREP3 here, this one gene, but uh, we can change the 
phenotype, the resistance phenotype of snails by removing FREP3 from the interaction. So it supports further the notion of immune roles, of immune recognition for uh, this FREP. That led us to uh, this particular model, uh, host parasite immune interactions, polymorphic systems. FREPs are polymorphic. They change all the time in a snail. So pick up a snail, and it'll have a certain combination of FREP genes indicated by these colors. Now, it turns out that the parasites that live in the snail have antigens that they also un make undergo antigenetic variation. So they also vary their antigens. And our notion is that if these uh, FREPs cannot recognize the carbohydrate surface of the parasite, um, what we see is that the immunity is not activated and the parasite will develop. However, if we happen to have a uh, set of genes that can recognize the parasite, we see activation of a whole immune cascade, parasite is encapsulated and killed. So that explains a little bit of what we see here. Now, such a compatibility polymorphism of course is difficult to interpret, but imagine you're a parasite, you have a certain combination of antigens, and you encounter a snail. Now, the snail from the first time, the second time, the third time, is going to be different in its immune capabilities. Only if it happens to be of the, the red type can the parasite survive in there. If it, over time, changes to yellow and green, we end up in this situation, sorry, we end up in this situation, and the parasite cannot survive in there. So a very dynamic, very complex system to start interpreting infections of parasites in snails. How does it work in our snail? Uh, we know that in Bium filaria, there's a little organ we call the amoebocyte-producing organ, the APO, located right next to the heart. With infection, we see that it starts to proliferate, and this becomes a source of new hemocytes, new blood cells. We see those released into the blood. And our notion right now is that uh, they all start with the same DNA. Of course, that's how a snail remains a snail. But then during that proliferation, there is somatic diversification and DNA changes in some of these cells. And then as indicated by color, different hemocytes will make different recognition factors and expand the range of non-self immune capability of our snails. So snails are not defenseless, and they're not the same. They're going to be different from day to day, from individual to individual. So a very different view of animal immunology resulted. You've seen this picture before, but uh, we can also say there is diversification of immune factors. And you need to diversify your recognition, because if you do not, pathogens will track you and eliminate you. You become an evolutionary dead end. You must be able to recognize and defend against pathogens. FREPs are listed here. There's some other examples from other invertebrates that similar systems happen also in uh, specifically the arthropods where we've looked. There's been a name coined for this type of immunity, shotgun immunity, because there's a random generation of molecules, different specificities, and we'll just have to see whether they hit the target or not. But that is a significant change of how we see uh, immunity in invertebrates. From knowing the system, from characterizing it, my question, of course, was, well, how does it work in more detail? How many of those factors exist? To answer those questions, uh, you cannot just work, extract DNA from a snail, do PCR, and look at sequences. You actually need a genome to study that. So for me, that was the main initiative to lead an international effort to develop a genome. And these days, genomes are easily obtained, of course. You can basically do it in your own lab overnight. At that time, uh, we need to get money from the government, from the international consortium, etc. We needed to show that we could do it. All these hurdles had to be taken. But after a long set of activities and efforts, uh, in 2017, we were able to publish for the first snail uh, the genome of Bium filaria because of its contact as a snail vector. My real reason is I want to study the immunity of that snail, and of course the data allow me to do so. That allowed me a look <coughs> closer at uh, bioflare immunology. And uh, initial analysis of the genome showed me there was, oh, maybe 24, 25 genes. We've refined that uh, more recently here. And we recognize clearly about 39 FREP genes that can be diversified. And then, interestingly, what we see is that strains that are predictably resistant or susceptible to the parasite actually differ in the germline genes that they transmit to their offspring. 
This picture here shows that. The red boxes show uh, coding differences along the length of a FREP sequence. And we see that SNP variants indeed differ among those strains and they may relate to resistance. So immunology is continuing to develop for snails. Beautiful system, so we know it all, right? Go back to our phylogeny and say, uh, oh, this system here that I just described happens in Planorbidae because Biom phylaria is here somewhere. I looked it up yesterday. It's in this list. I know it right here. Do all snails do it that way? You would like to think that, right? Because why do we use model organisms? They instruct on phylogeny. This is one of the more derived groups of these gastropods, and you might think that that is true. So that question, do limnaids and physids use this same system? Literature, international communities help out here, because this is where we start to see complexities. Uh, Limnaeus Tagnalis, I spent a sabbatical with uh, Otto Sapele in Zurich, he's now in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, we looked at Limnaeus Tagnalis, next generation sequencing, we had a big transcriptome, and uh, we only found two FREP genes. Not the, what was it, 40 or so that we see in Biom Filaria. Uh, with a grad student of mine, Jonathan Schultz, uh, we looked at Ficella, we started to look at that. We only found two FREP genes, not the 44 biomphalaria. Recent publication from Bulinus truncatus, another planorbid snail, which actually falls out, oh, where's the bull, in this particular group, also a planorbid snail. The text says, identification classification in this snail, a planorbid of a single FREP-like lectin, and no gene expansion event in this group, is in accord with studies from the pond snail, Ficella acuta, this paper, common periwinkle, Litorina littoria, and the sea hare, Aplysia californica. FREPs do not serve the same role in closely and more distantly related snails. So model systems can throw you for a loop. They may misinform you, or at least misdirect your understanding of the general biology of larger groups. There's other complexities. Uh, looking, and again, we're in the genomics era. These are results from RNA-seq. These are heat maps. So this shows here that Biom filaria uh, responds with thousands of different genes differently depending on the pathogen it encounters. So there's different responses possible. This here is a heat map from uh, Ficella acuta, and we see a before and after uh, short-term, long-term infection to a certain parasite. These images are mesmerizing. What do they mean? Uh, I want to summarize as transcript of some expanded snail immune gene families are expressed after challenge. And we see that here. But if we take a closer look, different family members of those gene families are expressed depending only on the specific challenge. What you see here is with this parasite early on, the purple indicates expression, and then the gene is turned off. Other genes that begin dark are switched over. Now, these are genes with related functions. So there's a dyna dynamic adaptation of the response to the parasite and the disease stage that is happening. How does that fit in with all of our knowledge? With this slide, I expect people to stand up and run out of the room because it's very complex. But what you see on the left is a list of immune genes from Limnaea stagnalis. And on the right, bottom axis, I should say, you see different groups of snails that have been harassed differently. So there are some control snails to our left, but also snails that have been wounded, like here. These have been injected with E. coli, gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria. These have been exposed to proteins from parasites. These have been heat-stressed and food-deprived. Now, what we start to see here is that uh, some genes, immune genes, are expressed all the time, like this row of what's called MIF, but a certain cytokine is only switched on if they encounter a particular type of bacteria. So we see that dynamic response again. Uh, but what I'll point out is those are sort of average results and interpretation. But look at the snail right here in this group. You can see that snails respond fairly similar. But here, this snail does not produce IK beta. It does not make interleukin-17. It does, oh, it makes a lot more of lysozyme, another antibacterial factor. 
So even if we know immunity, we should not consider the average response, because that's what RNA-seq does, but we may have to look at individual snails, and here we see that there is variety in immune responses from snail to snail, just like we respond differently to pathogens. So there is an enormous level of complexity to actually understand the interaction of populations of snails with pathogens. It is not a same response for all. By the way, Otto, right there. Then, we also need to consider that we focus on one parasite. For BM filaria, it's Schistosoma mansoni, and we think, oh, the parasite selected for this and that. But realize that between the lab, right here, the field situation is much more complex. One snail species can, how can be home, can be host for a multitude of parasites. Each of those parasites has a different trick to fool the immunity of the host. So we need to consider all of that and study how these interactions really play out. That then gets me to Ficella acuta. Plenty of time left here. And um, I selected this snail for the particular reason that if you look at the American continent, uh, this is where uh, the snail has its native range. It evolved in North America. Little balloon right there is Albuquerque. That's my location uh, for my institute. That's where I live in the United States. And interestingly, this snail species not only occurs in that range, but it actually colonized effectively the whole planet. It is an invasive species. And that, of course, gives me added interest in the biology of this animal here. When I started to study uh, Ficella acuta, we see an image of that snail right here, I said, let's make certain that we know we have our snail. And I sequenced the full mitochondria. This was in 2013. And to my enormous surprise, uh, two snails collected next to each other in a lake in New Mexico, where I live, I found 10% sequence difference in the sequence of mitochondria. That ex exceeds, in many cases, the difference between genes of different uh, genera within a family. So I said, wow, do I really have Ficella acuta here? And phylogeny, phylogenetic analysis say, yes, you do, but they are dramatically different. Enormous variation. Things got even more interesting when a colleague of mine, uh, Abst here, did a global study and found that uh, mitogenome type A for the mitochondrial uh, uh, sequence occurs all over the planet. So it is globally invasive. The other type, B, is only found in the native range. So there's a difference in the fitness of these genetically characterized populations. How does that work with immunity? I am intrigued and I remain intrigued. Um, a bit more on the mitochondria here. So this is a complex slide again, but it shows those two different mitogenome types. I found a third type here also, and then I have a reference type for a known FISA. Looking at the sequences, I can annotate the genes right here, and it's already remarkable that the gene order is so different from all other gastropods. And then in Faisal acuta, that other Faisal has yet another genome order. If you put that in a simple phylogenetic tree, you can see that the uh, A and B really are Faisals. They, they group together. But that third type is completely on a different branch. And you might say, well, isn't that really a different species? This approach here says no, they really are the same. Because you can look at mitochondrial genomes, and of course all sorts of evolutionary processes may impact that, but if you compare the nuclear genomes, that of one species should be the same inside that species. So I work with a colleague, Bishop Kamal. Um, here we go again. Uh, we developed this little technique. It's not published yet, so we may get to that, but uh, we had incomplete genome assemblies, again, the time of genomics. Uh, incomplete means we cannot compare the whole genome to the whole genome for every uh, isolate. However, we can select the areas that we do have, and if we look at those particular areas, lots of computer work here, we can look at the SNP content, and we found there was less than 2% difference in SNP. So all these three very different mitogenomes are of the same species at the nuclear level. And whereas the mitogenome will say, oh, you have uh, a type C that's completely outside of the Fisid range, if you do that for the nuclear genome, you see that, yeah, Ficella has three different mitogenomes that occur in the species. This was my finding uh, recently this year. 
uh, a group from France also showed a very similar mitogenome uh, that they recovered from snails in France, from Ficella acuta in France. So this is a real component of the biology of Ficella. Checking my time here. So um, differential fitness in populations genetically characterized by different mitogenomes in one species. Differential fitness. Let's turn to high throughput sequencing and see whether we can make some sense out of that. I have an hypothesis that differential population fitness of Ficella acuta results from strain-specific genes. And the success of P. acuta populations may be due to a robust immune system. I am a comparative immunologist that can defeat a variety of pathogens. But I full well realize and accept into my hypothesis that also metabolic aspects may explain why one population conquers the world and the other is resolved to just its local native range. I will point out that most of our knowledge of snail immunity comes from lab studies. It is far less clear how immunobiology actually functions in the wild. So I feel I have a beautiful system to start looking in fitness, differences perhaps in immunobiology, and use Ficella acuta to do so. Then to get A and B snails, uh, up right is my graduate student Kevin, Kevin McQuirk. He took this approach to recruit those snails into the lab. We caught snails, we kept them separate, so Ficet snails field collected. Since they're simultaneous hermaphrodites, they will start to reproduce without ever mating. We can then use the ag masses to extract DNA sequence and see whether A or B snails for the mitogenome. Then knowing that from the ag masses, we can go back to the snail that produced the eggs and say, well, let's use one snail and start a whole lab line for A or B genome. Sounds great in theory. Sequencing the genomes, the mitogenomes from those snails, those different lineages, 12 each actually, shows that yes, we did successfully recruit into the lab different strains for A and B. I did not do the whole genome sequencing here, but looking at the nuclear genome, just the rDNA complex, those are identical between these two lines of uh, different mitohaplotype Ficella acuta. So we have recruited into the lab these particular snails. Then we're studying their fitness. Can we really see that there's differential fitness in that global versus that local population? Approach taken includes rewilding. And I know there's different definitions for it. For me, that means uh, in a tail of two populations, A and B within a species, that we are taking genetically characterized lab-bred P. acuta snails that will be exposed temporarily to natural conditions and recovered for analysis versus lab-maintained snails. Can we see difference fitness in the lab, and can we also see that in the field here? And we're doing that at two locations. This is my colleague again from New Mexico State, so down south in Las Cruces, and here in Albuquerque, we have a couple of field sites. I'm very pleased with that approach still, because uh, considering this here, lab studies looking at fitness parameters as growth rate, um, Oh, my one graph dropped down. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Size to maturity and the average egg mass snail production uh, over the lifespan of snails, I cannot find significant difference between A and B. But remember, A is global and B is local. So you would expect to see some difference there. The lab, with its nice and comfortable conditions, does not show that frustration ensued for a while, but we were also doing the rewilding, remember? And what you can see here is that uh, in the lab we keep snails in a tank in tanks, aquaria, but in the field we equip our tanks with uh, these floating bodies and we can float them on the water. This is one site, uh, Rio Grande Nature Center State Park, and these are the lids of two of those tanks side by side, A and B. So for those snails we've used from the same generation, another group of snails, and we have an A and B in the lab. Down south, New Mexico State University campus, this is a pond they have, and we float our snails right there, and we do similar experiments. Conditions are very different, uh, lab versus field. It is much more, uh, oh, what is it, alkaline in the field. Temperature varies greatly. Water hardness and nitrogen content, all very different. So very different environments, much more natural. Then if you start to look by sampling every other day for the number of eggs that are being produced, we do see that snails in the field, those are the green lines, actually produce many more eggs than they do in the lab. Uh, 
However, if we enumerate that, we can see that uh, there is not a significant difference in the amount of eggs in the field for A versus B, nor is there in the lab for A versus B. But we still say, okay, the field is clearly different from the lab. It evokes different responses from our snails, but no different fitness yet. This here, however, made us very happy, made some snails very unhappy, I think, because we saw a difference in snail survival. For instance, this experiment over the course of two weeks, starting with 20 snails, checking every other day, we saw that the A snails, a field, a lab, so we started 20 and a couple of snails die, but we have the same number still. The B snails, however, in the lab do just fine, no difference, but in the field, they died in massive numbers. Remember, these tanks are side by side. They're as close as you can put two boxes on the water. So these populations of bee snails are not as fit, and we saw that in uh, three of seven experiments, as the A snails. A big difference. Rewilding clearly is adding info that we could not obtain in the lab. Of course, we live in a time of genomics, so what is the underlying biology here? And we engage in RNA-seq to uh, start to explore that. RNA was extracted from all of our individual snails that survived the environment, so A versus B, global versus local. And um, I can discuss, I won't go into it now, but these are actually good RNA profiles. You might expect to see two peaks, one 18S, one 28S. Snails don't do that. I'm happy to explain that if people have questions about it. This is good quality RNA. That was plugged into an image like this, uh, a pipeline bioinformatics. Basically, we took our sequences. We uh, made certain that we're not looking at infected snails, because these are snails that were kept in the field for two weeks. They could be exposed to trematode parasites. Parasites have an enormous impact on the gene expression of their snail host, so we did not want to include that, so we've excluded those. We have a PCR, and we can check our sequences afterwards to make certain there are no trematodes in there. Pre-processing, uh, removing all the housekeeping things, we filtered out the mitogenomes and the ribosomal DNA because we don't want to look at the ribosomal uh, or mitochondrial DNA here. We want to look at the expressed genes. Taking it to the left here, we then have a curated RNA-seq data set, and we use that to make assemblies of the transcriptome. And now we will use that to see which genes are differentially expressed and make sense of those by computational uh, informatics. That approach is... Um, Progressing, we're sort of right here. We are starting to analyze, to annotate the sequences that we see. But before I get there, I'd like to uh, assure you that we are checking the trematode fauna. We want to know what parasites exist in New Mexico, and these are specific to Physella acuta. So some beautiful images of parasites, and uh, we need to exclude those. It is my plan afterwards to also see whether I can study the interactions of the two populations with these parasites. But be aware, we uh, are tracking and excluding parasites as a confounding factor. Also, we're using different approaches in our bioinformatics because there's so many assumptions in uh, methods that analyze differential gene expression. And I've chosen this graph here to demonstrate that point. Uh, from the same data set, if you use something CuffDiff, traditionally of the tuxedo suite, one of the mainstream uh, differential expression programs, you may get a certain percentage of uh, genes showing to be of interest. If you use another program, it's going to be a much greater number. By combining these two, I want to make certain that the genes I look at are actually differentially expressed and that I can relate them to previous studies that used similar softwares. So lots of complexities here. Another confounding factor is uh, just the time here. We are uh, working with a de novo assembly that is quite nice. We've used BUSCO, which is an estimate of completeness of the transcriptome, and it gives us great numbers. We've engaged in our analysis, and just earlier this year, a French group put a genome out, and we can use that as a reference to make a much better assembly. So <laughs> we're actually repeating our analyses right now with an optimal data set because the genome-guided assembly is going to give us less artifacts from what the computer does wrong, putting together sequences that are actually different genes, and we anticipate we get better insights into the biology of our Ficella. Uh, 
biology of Faisala then, uh, comparing A from B from that experiment I showed you, uh, these are the top 40 differentially expressed RNA-seq transcripts. Names here, hard to interpret, but what we see is the amount of genes. So dark means highly expressed, white means not expressed or very low expressed. What we see is that these gene patterns differentiate A and B. Snails from A, mitohaplotype, do things very different from B haplotype. This is the uh, bioinformatics behind it, but you can clearly see that A snails, by pointing right uh, in yellow, B snails do things very differently from the other snail. So we see different gene expression underlying different biology. You can visualize that several ways. This is exploratory, of course, but in this uh, principal component analysis, we see that the B snails on this side basically do the same thing whether they are in the field or in the lab. This captures the complexity of the transcribed genes. On the other side, the dots represent A snails. And what we see is that A snails in the lab mostly do things similar to B snails in the lab, but put them in the field and they become very diverse. They are much more flexible, it seems, in the genes that they can express to respond to different situations. Global, local flexibility may be part of the key why one is colonizing the planet and the other stays at home. If we look at things like this, I'm almost wrapping up here, uh, comparing lab to field, this is an ongoing process of course, but um, if we make comparisons, strain A in the lab versus the field, B in the lab versus the field, we see that there are almost 4,000 genes differentially regulated. Less than 1,000 for the B snails. If we look at the lab, A versus B, uh, here we go again, uh, almost 5,000 genes differently. In the field, 5,000 other genes, not a lot of overlap there. So there are enorm enormous changes in the responses, and A is very different from B. So these differentially expressed genes, and these are the criteria by which we select them as significant, include kinases, dephosphatases, transcription factors, metabolic and immune genes. Uh, to me, that means a lot, but basically it means that A snails are responding to the environment by ramping up immune activity. The B snails are actually showing signs of heat stress because they express heat shock proteins and they also express regulators of apoptosis, controlled cell death. In some level that is part of an immune response, but also is a losing immune response because you're killing your own cells as a snail. So they seem to be suffering a lot from the stress of the outside environment, whereas the A snails are saying, come on, give me more, I have a good defense and I can deal with pathogens that I'm seeing. But certainly, A is not B. And I'm focusing here on immunity, that is my background, but we are open to see what the uh, analysis will show us for other aspects of the organismal biology that underlie these differences. Here's another way of looking at that because we're also able to look at the individual responses. Every column here is an individual snail. Oops, almost at my last slide. So again, we see that A snails are not all the same. Every snail has a different response to what it encounters in the field. And we must consider that at some level, uh, how that impacts the population as a whole. So A is not B, A is not A, and B is not B. It's a very complex mess, and I'm excited to jump further into that and analyze what is going on. In conclusion, I would say that, of course, I will pursue replicates. I will do other survival dynamics and expose the snails to pathogens. <coughs> but I will point out that rewilding my approach, lab and field, expands our view of snail biology considerably. It reveals differential fitness in the field for genetically distinct P acute populations that differ in global versus local distribution. Yikes, here we go again. Um, RNA seq suggests that a highly flexible gene expression pattern associates with globally distributed population A of Ficilla acuta. And it indicates pending adaptation that response to environmental change involves several biological processes, including immunity. And I would speculate that the expression profiles show a fingerprint for adaptability. 
And adaptability is another way of saying invasive potential. So we might be looking at what allows a species or a population to become invasive within a species. There's a lot more to say, a lot more to talk about. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is the end of my uh, presentation here, but I thank you very much for your attention and uh, welcome any questions that you have. Thank you. How do we deal with the questions? Yes, please. Right. Um, I thought the wiring would be uh, having a system develop on its own, maybe adding something like we used to do, for example, the CSO that we that we have also had for space, a wild space. Right. But uh, I didn't fully get the connection to, to how you used it and what you mean by wiring. Well, it was just like like putting these uh, uh, specimens into into um, natural conditions. Uh, uh, effectively, yes. And I, I realize of that larger use and more common use of the definition as you describe it. You're absolutely correct at that. Um, we, we base this particular title on papers like Wild Biology. So if you put animals in the wild, even temporarily as I do here, uh, you get a different view of their immune capabilities. Uh, I apologize for the confusing use of the term. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can see what it is. But okay, but that is where I uh, put on the slide the definition when I introduced the term. Let me click back a couple of times. So you are correct in your question, saying uh, I have lab reared organis lab reared animals, and I put those back in the field for a limited amount of time. So as it, uh, I've, I've aimed to capture that here. So I have my genetically characterized lab bred Piacuba snails of strain A and B, because. Um, let, me, let me continue on first. They will be temporarily exposed. So indeed, I take those snails. I have 40 snails from both lines. I split them up randomly in groups of 20. 20 go to the field, and 20 remaining for that population stay in the lab. And I do that for both strains. Then at the end of a one- or two-week exposure, we collect all the snails and we analyze them. So that way we can have a comparison of uh, genetic, uh, genetically identical snails how they perform under these two conditions. And we feel that the genetically characterized approach is so important because that removes the, uh, the noise, if you will, if you don't know what the background of your snails is. As I've indicated here, a snail A that looks the exact same as snail B. So if you just go to the field and collect those snails uh, from the field, you don't know whether you have a type A or B. And we see that they actually behave very differently. Thank you for your question. <laughs> it is good to clarify that further. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Can I? Sorry, Jeff. I please. Right? Absolutely. Yes, we see some of that in that specific uh, combination of BM filaria with schistosomes and with echinostomes. Um, it is exactly for that reason that we're trying to, or not trying, that we are excluding parasite infected snails from the field exposed population. Because I have no clue what all those unknown parasites for which I showed pictures would have on an impact on the immune expression. Uh, in Ficella, and I would not know how to make a comparison uh, to just see what the snail response is to the difference in environment. But there's a, a, a dramatic uh, field out there that indeed looks at the immunomodulation of snail host uh, uh, expression by parasites. There are parasites that are able to um, uh, be very stealthy about it, there's a system that we call immunomasking or immunomimicry, whether they acquire antigens from the host and coat their surface with that, or they express genes that are very similar, antigenic genes on their surface that are very similar to uh, uh, gene products of the snail host. Basically, they put on a camouflage coat and say, I'm not here, you're, you're not seeing me. Uh, 
The other extreme of that is uh, some echinostomes, for instance, so not the schistosomes, but uh, they are able to release factors that actually uh, negatively impact the defense cells. So defense cells will not go towards the parasite that they must defend against, but they'll move away from it. And if there's not a close interaction between the defense cells and the pathogen, uh, even if the defense cells start to make defense products, killer effector molecules, they cannot get them at a high concentration to the parasite. And the parasite like, says, I'm here, respond all you want, but you cannot deliver that cytotoxic payload on my surface, you cannot kill me. And within that, of course, all sorts of gradients exist. There's, uh, what did I say, somewhere between 18 and 40,000 different uh, parasite species of this group known. Uh, the more we look, the more differences we find, the more nuances on that spectrum uh, for these interactions. It's a fascinating field, so, of course. Any other questions? I see one in the back there. If, if I hear it correctly, your question is, what is the best biocontrol to minimize the presence of certain snails that might transmit disease uh, or... Okay, so that, that is a tricky question. The, uh, traditionally, we have relied uh, for control of parasite-transmitted diseases on uh, molluscicides, but the uh, Bayer is a big uh, provider of that. Balocide is the uh, copper-based uh, toxic compound for snails. Um, it works great against snails, but unfortunately it works against all snails. It may also impact arthropods and fish in the environment. So that type of control is not sustainable in the long term because it destroys whole ecosystems. Um, can you apply that locally in case of severe need for a heavy infection uh, intensity of schistosomes? Yes, and it, it has been applied in that manner. Uh, more recently, whole countries are sort of shying away from that because, of course, they want to protect. We should protect our environment. Uh, the alternatives that are presenting themselves are chemicals extracted from plants. Uh, some of those have a good role and can be applied locally. Uh, if they're extracted directly from the plant without chemical production uh, independently, then the dosage is unreliable and you may have good or less efficient control at the local level. Um, and there are now other notions that we may not have to rely on chemicals. There's efforts for biological control. We know of predators of snails. Uh, there has been a big project in Ghana where a uh, crawfish, I think I'm saying that right, so uh, uh, a prawn-like arthropod, any help with the name, uh, Procambrius clarkii is the name of the species, but um, that is a arthropod that really loves to eat Biomphalaria snails and they gobble them up. The bad thing is that um, the, the local population does not appreciate the presence of those big, scary-looking arthropods in their drinking water. So it has an application. It can be quite effective, and the crayfish may die after the snails are out of the environment, so that uh, becomes a good application. But it may be difficult to apply it at, at particular locations. More recently, there are notions of genetic modification of snails. We have genomes, we have CRISPR, we have RNA interference. We can begin to consider modifying the genomes, and we may be able to build in uh, genes that make the snails more resistant, for instance, to infection, uh, or to uh, make certain that they do not survive certain conditions. That, of course, comes with the whole complexity of genetically modified organisms and introducing those, applying those in the field. There is a, uh, a safety issue. Uh, there is a political issue. There is a uh, community concern issue to that. That all must be resolved, must be addressed, uh, worked out, and resolved before that can actively happen. Uh, it seems I'm, I'm providing more problems than actually benefits from control. Uh, that is not my intent. But control of these parasite-transmitted diseases requires an integrated approach where uh, you may be able to treat the population with drugs against the parasites. You may be able to remove some of the snails from the environment. Uh, looking for snails, I know you can never get all snails out of the environment. That is tricky. There may be limited purpose for those uh, molluscocyte applications without destroying the environment, etc., etc. Uh, 
I expect that uh, the big chemical companies are looking, uh, the biochemical companies are looking at approaches that will involve genetic manipulation in the not too distant future. Thank you for your question. I hope I answered that. Please. Right. Okay, the number of trematode parasites, that's the group we're talking about. The question was how many of those uh, up to 40,000 are actually pathogens for humans. I would say that among the schistosomes that I mentioned, uh, there is a whole host of other parasites that can be uh, uh, acquired by ingestion. There is the liver fluke, for instance, causative agent of liver rot. Um, parasites live in the, the, the gold ducts or in the liver and ultimately destroy that. Uh, their presence associates with the incidence of cancer. Uh, some of these parasites are actually designated now, recognized medically as oncogenic, believe it or not, because they <laughs> irritate and they change the gene transcription in our tissues that uh, give rise to that notion. So those are foodborne trematodiases. Long name, but basically you eat them and you acquire them that way. Uh, we do have Facilia hepatica, so the liver fluke here in Europe. Uh, limnate, snails, amphibious will impact livestock here dramatically. Wildlife also. There are many related parasites that would do that. Uh, but in restricting my response to medically important and veterinary important parasites of this group, I would estimate a bit of hand waving here that we're talking about 50 or 60 species, certainly that would have that impact. Talk to a vet, they might say, well, there's 100. Don't, <laughs> don't catch me on that number. Um, I would say that these parasites can effectively, as a group, infect any vertebrate that we look at outside from birds. Uh, there are parasites that are transmitted on land, so they rely on land snails for their transmission. But if, if you contact water as a vertebrate, you are likely a potential host in a specific life cycle of one or more species of these parasites. The snails certainly are. Uh, <laughs> that's my part of interest in these life cycles. But yeah, uh, in my studies, I, I uh, pick up snails and inspect them for infection. It is a lot more tricky to inspect, to find these parasites in vertebrates, of course. Permit-wise, you can't go and shoot and kill all animals to see, oh, do you have one worm in your, uh, uh, your circulation or your intestine? Um, that is a lot trickier. You also have to find them, of course. So, but yeah, so significant disease caused in uh, uh, in cattle, livestock, and in humans by not too large. I'm happy to say uh, a group of parasites. Uh, I'll add to that. Um, certainly, in these environments, uh, are you aware of what's something called swimmers itch or sacarial dermatitis? That is also caused by these parasites. So snails will release parasites that look for a bird host, and they can infect those by penetrating through the skin of the birds. But a vertebrate skin and the signals, the chemical cues we leave, will attract also these bird parasites to our bodies. And uh, um, I grew up in the Netherlands. I, I know I've had <laughs> several bouts of uh, red bumps after swimming in water, after sailing. Uh, these are parasites in your skin. They've penetrated there. They're looking for bird physiology to move around and go through their development. If they can't find that in our own body, they will die there. You'll get inflammation, you'll get itches, and uh, that can be very significant whole commercial enterprises that do boating or swimming in surface water uh, have folded because they go rogue. People don't want their kids to go swim and come out with itchy skin and red wells. So uh, that would add up to 100, I think, <laughs> if I talk about the number. Let it be 200, no more than that total. Thank you for your question. Very common in southern Europe. I believe that, so yes. Votichka Virachka. Votichka Virachka. Yeah, the local okay. Uh -huh. ponds, right. Reservoirs. Especially uh, when it gets a bit warmer, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Warm, particularly uh, snails and vegetation. Mm-hmm. No. It tends to be the, mi the migratory birds that bring the parasites. They will take some time in the snails to develop from infection to release. Usually about six weeks, but if it gets warmer, these cold-blooded animals, of course, speed up production. And within four weeks, perhaps after introduction of birds, you can predictably get these uh, 
these infections. I've worked some with a group in Prague from Petr Horak and uh, Libor Mikes uh, to look at these particular parasites also. But uh, yeah, that's yeah, when you're exposed to them a long time, you get desensitized. So in the Netherlands, I'm not that afraid to go swim. Here I would be careful because the parasites are slightly different. <laughs> my uh, immune system might respond by, again, giving me circurial dermatitis. But, uh, interesting. Is swimming is a very issue? I mean, for students, if you could ask for more severe... Right. So it's very uh, annoying. It, it can be extremely annoying. But over long-term exposure, it actually uh, reduces. I used to say that that was not a big deal because you go through it and ultimately you get desensitized. But some of these parasites are uh, what we call the somatic parasites. They will travel through your blood system. So if they get there, they'll, they'll circulate there. There is a group that we call the nasal avian schistosomes, however. They are neurotropic, so they will migrate through your body along your nerve bundles. And if you get inflammation because of clearance of the parasites at that site, uh, certainly in, in small animals, perhaps in young children, but again, we can't dissect the young children, luckily, <laughs> to look, but you may get paralysis in animals because of inflammation in the central nervous system. So uh, I've, I've gone away from just saying, oh, I don't mind these infections. They can be somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat dangerous, causing paralysis temporarily. But... Uh, You're welcome. Uh, uh, quite different for our training. Sure. Know, but, uh, I, I'm learning things here, so but continue with your question. But it, it's great to interact yeah, on these matters. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, that's a great question. I'd like to emphasize I'm, I'm still analyzing the pattern, so I'm not yet saying this is the full explanation why it has, but it's a remarkable observation at this time. Um, there's a, a colleague I have from Iowa, Maureen Neiman. She looks at uh, the uh, Potomopergus antipoderum, which is the New Zealand mud snail, invasive also across the planet. Um, we, we, we've talked about these things. She has also engaged but has not published on similar approaches and also speculated immune genes as a potential uh, uh, group of genes that may be differentially responsible for uh, invasiveness. But that has not been published, so <laughs> don't get me. Uh, I, I believe it's a, um, uh, a master's thesis. Okay, good. We, we agree there. Uh, the difference, of course, with that snail, a prosobranch, is that it's uh, parthenogenic. I always mispronounce that word, but it reproduces clonally. There is no uh, male-female interaction there needed for, uh, for offspring. Um, and that may be a big part where it is so efficient in reproductive... Uh, uh, potential colonization of new areas because uh, even more than the physids, which do, by the way, self, they're hermaphrodites, so one snail can colonize a whole new environment, but I would think Potomopergus is even more efficient at that. And it requires continued study to see whether similar things play out uh, in the biology of Potomopergus. Otherwise, I believe we're pretty much stuck at the observation that some snail species or uh, species within genera or strains within a species are so invasive. There is a biomphalaria species, Straminia, different from uh, Glabrata that I worked with, that uh, has, uh, or is it has colonized uh, Hong Kong and is moving into Southeast Asia from there. And that did not used to be there. Uh, again, there is some speculation that it may have to do with the pattern of reproduction, either selfing or outcrossing. Uh, 
another model to look at. These snails are so nice for me because they are native. If I, I aim not to have, but if I had an escape from the lab, uh, native snails end up in their native environment. And I'm not that concerned about the uh, containment that I would be seriously concerned about of a potential invasive species uh, releasing that in any other environment would be very difficult, it's very difficult, very dangerous. Uh, in fact, um, I, I tried once to work with African giant land snails, Achatina fulica or Achatina achatina, and it is a federal offense in the United States to have those snails alive in your possession. In the 70s, they broke out from, uh, I think, a, a pet store in Florida, and the, the state of Florida uh, continues to spend millions of dollars to control those very voracious uh, pests of agriculture. And they're big if you crush them in the road and you get a stinky mess. They reproduce e at enormous rates. Uh, so, yeah, be very careful uh, studying invasive species outside of their native range, I would say. In mar -a -Lago? I would hope so. I would hope so. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> Do we know any information about what's the source area or native area of that same age? The, um, uh, since both occur in the native range, I would speculate that they have been there all the time and are still present and have spread out to uh, the other parts of the world that I showed on the global map. Um, this group from France has done quite some analysis and are finding very interesting uh, results. Uh, the snail that they have as their main normally reproducing uh, type is very similar to my A. So that is the A type. Um, if that is the native range, they must have come from there. I cannot say whether it's sort of uh, A left the United States and traveled back over time, given the enormous uh, transport we have now of goods, of, of plants, of uh, water. I cannot exclude that now and then A makes it back to the States after a long stay away from, uh, from the United States, from North America. Uh, but my assumption is that it is uh, its current range. I'll, I'll remind you of the fact that the two snails I picked up from one lake in New Mexico, very much landlocked, desert, um, A and B were right next to each other and I routinely recover them still from the sites where I go. So uh, I'm assuming, all right, I'd be happy to talk. All right, fantastic. All right, thank you. Any other questions? I'm not sure about the time here, but. Um, the question is, what harm does Vicella acuta do when in invaded places? And this is a great question. I, it's hard to indicate a direct uh, uh, damage, but by occupying the environment, making it less accessible, stealing nutrients and resources away from the other species locally, uh, it can uh, reduce, it can minimize, it can jeopardize native populations of other species. Um, it, it has been called the rat now of snails, because anywhere it goes, you will find large numbers of physids. It is not that they completely take over the environment, but uh, at the numbers they achieve in invaded ranges, uh, I can see that they would pose some risk to displace native species. Uh, there's a great plasticity in Ficella, so it can actually, in just in a couple of generations, change its morphology of the shell, for instance, quite dramatically. And that allows it to stay in fast-flowing water, in lakes, in all sorts of habitats uh, where more specialized forms have developed to uh, benefit from that environment. So they're a voracious competitor, I would say. But uh, other than potentially introducing parasites from the original range to the new range, uh, I would say that the biggest danger is that they displace native species. Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes. I'm coming closer and closer here. I wonder if you know the potential differences in the species and the species. Yeah. I have to sort of, oops. 
this moved uh, back out a little bit. I, that's a great question. I'd like to look at that. Uh, one of the questions I'm, I'm currently looking at is whether there is some uh, reproductive barrier between A and B, for instance. The mitochondria are very different. There is this whole coordination is essential for uh, the, um, uh, the mitochondrial genome and the expression of the genes that come from the nuclear genome but need to be transported into the mitochondria uh, to make the organism work. Clearly, they both work. Um, the, uh, if I pick up a snail, and I do not look with your eyes, with the, the expertise that exists here yet, I do not see differences. Uh, Michel showed uh, the white band on the side of snails. If I had to say anything, I think that white band that you pointed out on the morphology of these snails was on my first slide, I believe. That... I think is more prominent on the B snails than the A snails, but I, 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 that is speculation at this time. I'm not sure that is a consistent difference. As you saw from the other images, uh, they grow at the same rate, produce the same amount of eggs over time, at least in the lab. Uh, that way I cannot see a difference, but I will let you know. The error bars are, are fairly similar, yes, but... Uh, but I'm, I'm digging deeper into that because there has to be some other impact. Uh, if their fitness is different in the field, what is that? And where are those genes? Yeah. And before we come to You're next, but <laughs> you you were first. Uh, question about about uh, moving people around when you take stress with big things of other places. Right. Right. Uh, there, there are several potential outcomes for moving a host to a new location. And if it brings a parasite, it can be spilled back, it can be spilled over. Exactly, yeah. So they may provide an alternative host. Uh, th this relates a little bit to the question you asked, <laughs> I think. Um, bringing parasites or fortifying the life cycles uh, of existing parasites can also lead to amplification of the number of infections or they may actually dilute uh, the impact of parasites because if they get infected by certain parasites that cannot survive in that snail host, it may dilute the uh, uh, development of these parasites. So yes, in that way, invasive species have dram can have dramatic impacts on either but making... I'm looking at a native system, um, so I'd have to go to literature. I cannot tell you uh, a great detail on that. Uh, every time I look for uh, parasites that go through Physella acuta, I find one or two papers that I published myself. Uh, people are looking at that. Part of me showing the image of all the parasites I'm recovering from Physella is that I'd like to know what parasites those are. And now we can start to see whether, for instance, parasites that are transmitted by birds and Physella are... Uh, I, I guess a great example is the avian schistosomes that are basically occurring across the planet wherever you have uh, physids and birds, migratory birds. Uh, those life cycles exist and they may be spread as globally as they are because of just that notion that uh, uh, a snail host has been transported all over the planet. Because uh, we can have commercial transportation, human activity, uh, anthropogenic transport, but uh, aquatic snails like these also travel quite well on the, the feet and the feathers of birds. So migratory birds not just bring the parasites at the vertebrate host stages, but they may also transport the snails. And, uh, Um, I, I'll, I'm reminded by your question also of the notion of uh, the uh, spread of Schistosoma mansoni to South America. Uh, 
the idea there is that the snail originally lived and developed on the South American continent, so Biom Falaria as a genus, and that the schistosomes came out of Asia and established in an unknown snail host, uh, not Biom Falaria, not present as a genus there at the time. And we're talking up to 8 million years in the past. Um, then there was a, uh, uh, a transport event where a Biomphalaria snail made it to Africa and started to diversify, to speciate. Uh, we still see that in the genetic diversity of the genera, I'm sorry, not the genera, the species in Africa, very much closely related, Pfeifferi, Coenomphala, uh, all the other species that exist there. Uh, they are much more similar to just one species in South America, Biomphalaria glabrata, whereas the other species in South America are much more diverse. Um, there was the um, uh, acquisition then of uh, Biomphalaria as a host by the schistosomes. Uh, it became a very efficient life cycle. Then only centuries ago, with the unfortunate connection to slave trade, when people were being forced, forcibly transported from Africa to South America, the parasite also made it across, and it found the uh, snails from the same genus. So not the African species, but uh, the original, the founding Glabrata species, and they are highly adapted to that. So those parasites made it across, and they said, oh, we have a host in the environment here. Humans are here also, so the life cycle uh, has been proposed to originate from that particular process in South America. That is invasiveness one direction from a long time ago from South America to Africa, and then indirectly showing that indeed it may have enormous impacts on the spread of parasites. That's the closest direct example I can think of. But, uh, thank you for your question. Good. Correct. And then you, you see the differences in the Yes. And uh, do, do you have some genomic data on the instrument that is a nuclear DNA? And do you observe some problems with that? That you said that they can do. Right. Uh, for the process that actually gave rise to these different um, occurrences of 10% of, of difference at the mitogenome, uh, there's about four different patterns we can suggest why that has happened. Whether it was introgression or something else, I, I do not know. Um, the um, genomic information goes back to three individuals of both A and B, where we have Illumina sequencing, and now we have the, the French genome published also, which I associate with an A strain, so we can start to look at that. It is one of my big questions. As in, uh, indeed, is a B snail so much less invasive or less fit, let's, let's say that before I say invasive, than an A, because there's a certain allele of a critical gene to respond to a certain pathogen. I don't know that yet, but since we have the transcriptomes, we can start to look for that. First, we will look at the difference you express genes, and then we'll actually start to compare the nucleotide composition of those genes to see whether they represent uh, at least versions, like the alleles, maybe expansion in a gene family of less efficient for countering a pathogen, but maybe more efficient to counter another pathogen. Great question. I cannot answer that yet, but those are things we will be looking at. Uh, it may be the expression patterns. It may be the actual genetic content that is slightly different. And just a couple of nucleotides can make a big difference in how effective the protein is that is encoded by that gene. So more in uh, maybe next year <laughs> I can tell you more about that. Um, you also asked about the mitogenome, and I was almost expecting that uh, question here. So we are excluding the mitogenome uh, sequences altogether from our expression analysis. We have done a separate analysis, and we do not see uh, clear evidence of differences of, say, there's more CO1 being expressed in the invasive snail versus the, the global snail. So at this time, I still feel comfortable in not looking at differential expression of the uh, mitochondrial genes, which might associate with a different efficiency of the metabolism. It does not seem to be the case that that drives this whole difference in, uh, in fitness being distinct. But uh, maybe over beer, more questions, we can discuss this. I'd love to hear your input. All right.
Jeff? Not that question. Um, functionally, no, but I've looked, of course, at the genomes that you have collected, that I have collected. Um, we see the same aspect that there are a few FREP genes. Okay. Um, so it does not seem to be that uh, they rely heavily on FREPs. There is a, another family of related genes that I call FREDs, so not with a P but with a D, Fibrinogen domain containing proteins. Those are just single Fibrinogen domains, and it seems that those might be diversified. But something very different happened in the, uh, the planorbid snails compared to all the other gastropods. That's my shortest answer. Over beer, much more, because there's a, there's a whole story there. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you. All right. Thank you all.